for years you've been lied to. And I'm here to deliver some uncomfortable truths. You've been told that you can't hear anything above 20 kilohertz. If you're my age or older, that number drops to 16 kilohertz, maybe even 13 kilohertz. Only, that's not true. Not just that it drops, but that you could only ever hear to 20 kilohertz. Back when researchers were trying to identify the ideal cutoff frequency for digital sampling, they conducted experiments that required participants to answer questions and assess what they could hear subjectively. That research concluded that content above 15 kilohertz didn't influence the perceived audio quality for listeners. Straight away, we could ask a bunch of questions about those tests, such as whether the listeners were trained listeners or musicians or just the average Joes. But let's not waste time talking about why those studies might not have been right. Instead, let's focus on a study that tells us far more. As time's gone by and science has evolved, because that's what science does, a few things became apparent. Some researchers found that exposure to infrasonic sounds might have an adverse effect on human health, suggesting that sounds we can't hear are still able to influence our bodies. And during the same period of time, it was proposed that because humans regularly inhabit places like rainforests, which are extremely rich in high frequency sounds above 20 kilohertz, that we should have evolved some type of physiological sensitivity to those sounds. These lines of thought spawn studies like the one I want to share with you today, where researchers have used modern imaging techniques like electroencephalography and positron emission tomography to measure the brain activity of people listening to music with and without high frequency content, and specifically high frequency content above the limits of what we've previously believed we can actually perceive. And the results of these studies raise some really interesting questions. This particular study took place in Japan, and it involved 66 different volunteers ranging from the ages of 18 up to 43. It was also a mixture of males and females. If you want the full breakdown of the three different experiments that make up this study, and all the details of the equipment used and the methodologies, I'll link the full article, the full journal article, in the description down below for you. What matters to us though, is that there was a good spread of participants in terms of both age range and also gender, and that there was an overall good number of participants too. I don't know if this is actually relevant and important for this test, but you might want to know that all of the participants involved were also familiar with the instrument they used for these tests, and it's a traditional Balinese instrument called the gamelan. It was selected because it naturally produces harmonics all the way up to 100 kilohertz. In other words, it doesn't have individual notes that go above 20 kilohertz, but some of the lower fundamental notes that you can play on a gamelan will produce lots of harmonic and resonant frequencies up towards 100 kilohertz. All right, so let's get a little bit technical just for a moment because these next bits are important so we know that this test was done right. The music for this test was all recorded using very high quality recording gear made entirely by BNK, the same people who make high-end speaker and headphone measurement devices. And the recordings were encoded using a high quality one bit signal processor that had a sampling frequency of 1.92 megahertz, meaning that it could very easily and comfortably capture all the frequencies required and deliver a flat frequency response in the recording all the way up to 100 kilohertz. The next challenge was making sure that they had a playback system that could also reproduce the sound again with a flat frequency response. And so they actually designed a pair of systems using separate amplifiers and separate speakers where one would carry all the information up to around about 22 or 26 kilohertz and then the other would take over for the ultrasonic frequencies. As a reminder, all the fine details of all the equipment used and the setup design and the crossover frequencies, all of that's in the description down below via the link. This fancy paired playback system also required the production of some dedicated crossovers to ensure that the frequency response of the playback was flat from 20 hertz all the way through to 100 kilohertz. And so as you can see in the graphs that I'm putting on screen, they were able to keep the frequency response fairly consistent and fairly linear whether it was just the low frequency content playing the audible frequency content or the high frequency content combined with it. One thing that I thought was kind of cool was that in this experiment they allowed each of the listeners to adjust the volume to suit their own listening preferences. And so the emphasis was to create a comfortable and normal kind of listening environment for each of these tests to take place. In other words, they wanted to put the emphasis on whether or not the high frequency content made any difference and not skew things from having an uncomfortable listening experience, a weird and unsettling room that they were sitting in. They did their best to isolate just the thing they were looking for. 
In the first experiment, they used EEG equipment to track brain activity while listening to versions of the music with and without the high frequency content. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, they made sure to hide all of the technical equipment so it just felt like a normal living room listening environment. For this test, participants listened to a 200 second recording of the entire piece of music played on the Gamelan, and they listened to a version with all of the frequency content from 20 hertz all the way to 100 kilohertz as well as a low frequency only version, which cut off at around about 22 kilohertz from memory on this test. And of course, they also took measurements when there was no music playing to provide a baseline of what participants' brains were doing with no music playing at all. For this experiment or this test, participants were asked to have their eyes closed so that eye movement wouldn't influence the EEG results. And what the results showed is that listening to the music with the high frequency content included produced additional brain activity and particularly in the occipital and parietal regions of the brain. This is particularly interesting to me because the parietal lobe in the brain is responsible for our spatial awareness and our integration of inputs from all the different senses. Think of it as the area that we process the world around us and our space within it. The occipital lobe is the area where we process visual information, but it's also the area where we process things like distance and depth perception. If you combine the responsibilities of both of these parts of the brain, it makes me wonder if somehow the high frequency content is being used to help our understanding of this sense of soundstage size, soundstage space, and placement of sounds within that soundstage. But that's just me speculating, and in doing so, I've bypassed something really important. What this first experiment suggests at a fundamental level is that even though we can't consciously perceive high frequency content, we seemingly can sense it and have a physiological response to it. So let's talk about experiment two. Experiment 2 used EEG once again, and again it ran a series of musical samples as well as some baseline measurements. However, this time, the researchers also measured the brain response when only the high frequency content was playing without the low frequency part of it. In other words, participants wouldn't have consciously perceived any sounds, but their brain activity would reveal if it was influencing them in other ways. This test demonstrated similar brain activity compared to test one, with once again both the parietal and occipital brain areas lighting up more when the full range sound was played. What I also found interesting was that the occipital areas of the brain were also moderately active when at rest when there was no music playing, but when listening to music without the high frequency content with just the audible band playing, the activity in the occipital area of the brain, the visual area, actually decreased. And then when the music was played with the high frequency content included, that activity in the occipital region not only returned, but increased beyond the baseline levels. It's worth noting that for this particular test, participants were instructed to just keep their eyes opened in a natural and relaxed way. And so the test results might suggest that they stopped processing visual inputs as much when listening to the audible band frequency without the high frequency content. And then either they processed more visual information with the full range music, or they were processing the depth and spatial information in the music when it had the full range sound. Again, this last little interpretation is my own theory. It's not discussed in the paper. The final measurements in this study used positron emission tomography or PET scanning, and that was used to map blood flow within the brain during the listening tests. Once again, the setup was designed to ensure as little impact on the comfort of the participants as possible, and these tests showed increased activity in the auditory centers of the brain when music was playing, as you'd expect. What it also showed was that if only the high frequency content was played on its own, there was no change to brain activity. In other words, if we weren't consciously perceiving the sound, those auditory centers weren't lighting up. And the same was true for the baseline measurements. If there was no music playing, the auditory centers were more quiet. Where things get juicy though, is that when the full range content was playing with the ultrasonic frequencies, it activated what they call deep lying structures in the brain. Sounds mysterious, doesn't it? Like a newly discovered ancient artifact that's been buried for a millennia. In reality, what it means is that the brainstem and the thalamus became more active. Both of these areas are involved in regulating our levels of consciousness and sleep, and the thalamus also helps with the integration of all the different sensory inputs and in regulating our attention levels. When music without the ultrasonic content was played, those areas became less active than when no music was playing at all. And when only the ultrasonic content was played, those areas behaved as if there was no sound at all. But at this point, I want to talk about one final piece to this puzzle that makes it all the more real and relevant for us audiophiles and music lovers. And that is that the researchers also conducted a survey with participants, and that combined them listening to versions of the music with and without the ultrasonic content. This questionnaire showed that participants could differentiate the two types of music with extremely high statistical significance across five of the measured elements. 
In other words, this isn't just a clinical measurement of stuff going on inside our bodies that we're unaware of. It also directly influenced the perceived enjoyment of the music. And if I'm reading the table correctly, the preferences were all towards the full range content. And so the summary of all this is fascinating to me. In short, this is evidence that we're all affected by sounds that are well beyond the frequencies that we can consciously perceive. It also suggests that the inclusion of ultrasonic frequencies within our music could improve our enjoyment of that music. What's not so clear is how this works. This study would indicate that we need those high frequencies to be present alongside the lower frequencies that they kind of belong with for us to be influenced by them. However, there are other studies suggesting that our brains and the auditory centers of our brains can be activated by ultrasonic frequencies that we can't actually perceive to the point that even people with complete hearing loss can still have those auditory centers activated by ultrasonic sounds. And so there's a lot to understand in this area of study before we have clear answers. And on that note, hit the like button and leave me a comment if you want to come with me and dive deeper into this topic. For now, I think this opens some incredible opportunities for the improvement of recording and playback chains in the future. And the result of those improvements could be an even greater sense of connection and engagement with the music we all love. It could help us to actually connect with the music at a deeper physiological level and get us closer and closer to that true live music experience. I, for one, can't wait to find out. As always, I want to send a huge thanks to channel members, channel Patreon members, and to those of you that leave super thanks on videos like this one. As this is my first video on this topic, I don't have another one to recommend up here, so I'll let YouTube choose the one that it thinks is going to be best for you. But remember to like and leave me a comment if you want more videos like this one. For now though, happy listening, be kind to each other, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.